I'm going to believe she memorised it, but I don't know that she did, but it's very, very helpful. Let me pray. Heavenly Father, we do ask, please, that you might bless this time together now, that you might cause uh, the words I speak and our thoughts to be pleasing to you. And we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, one of the things, uh, as we're kind of preaching and speaking to groups of people, one of the things I'm often, we're often searching for is kind of a way to kind of launch in and get people connected. Now, for many of you this morning, just saying that we're about now, we're going to now jump into the book of Ruth, that's enough. You've been waiting for this book for a long time. You know what it's about. It's a great love story. You know that it's got all the tensions and twists of a great romance. It's got despair and in the pit and it's got the hopelessness and concerns and finally boy meets girl and girl gets boy and it, now, spoiler alert, it ends happily. They get together. It's one of those wonderful uh, love stories and many of you, just, just knowing that's coming, you're excited by it. But for the rest of you, for the men, I dare say... You're wondering what's in it for me. Maybe if one of them beat up and there was a fight, but you know, what's in it for me? Well, here's a thought for you actually. Uh, you can, if you make sure you get along to church or stream in these next four weeks and sit with your wife and engage fully, you can, you can actually be clear that you have ticked the chick flick box this month. You've done it and that'll be worthwhile because when you're on Netflix, because you're all locked down, you're all trying to find out what to watch, and the whole discussion about what to watch comes up again, you can pull the, we've already done the romance card, can we do Bruce Willis? So I think some really helpful things to be found in this book as we go through, but as good as that reason actually is, there's a better one. This is far more than a love story. Yes, it's got a love story in it, but it's far more than that. I want to offer what it actually is about as we jump into it. It's about God and what he's like. It's about what it looks like to have God, the God of love, at work in your life when you can't see him. It's about what it is to have God at work in the lives of ordinary people in the midst of tragedy and loss and grief. You know, this is far bigger than a love story. It's got a love story in it. I mean, it's, it's a wonderful romance. It's beautiful. And, but it's more than a love story. And that becomes very clear when you get to the end of the book. Because I tell you, that the great climactic ending of the book is not girl, boy, together, riding off into the sunset. It's the mother-in-law, thrilled and filled up after being empty. That's the great finish to the book. Now, I love my mother-in-law, but I tell you, the great thing about my wedding was not my mother-in-law. The great thing was something else. You see, friends, it, this is not just a love story, and Naomi at the end of the story alerts you to there being more going on here. It's big. And let me put it to you in one word. This book is about hope. That there's always hope. There's always hope. It never needs to be hopeless because of the work of God in our lives. Now that's what the book is about. We're going to see it unfold as we go through. And it's a surprising book. It's only short, but it's got a great deal in it. And we're going to take it chapter by chapter. You know, you might expect, it's just a story. You might expect to go through the whole thing in one sitting. And we've been encouraged to do that. Make sure you do that this afternoon. We're going to go slow. We're going to take it chapter by chapter. Build the picture and live in it. And see if we can be part of what goes on, the detail and the richness and experience all that together. Uh, and today, what we're going to do is, is go through this chapter step by step, um, make a few comments about the passage on the way through, and sometimes step back and consider the background material to help us understand the story. But then pull it all together at the end and hit the big things. Hope and what this is about. So let's dive in. Verse 1. In the days when the judges ruled, there was a famine in the land. In the days when the judges ruled. Now we don't need to go into that in a great deal because last week we had a wonderful engagement with the book of Judges, the days when the judges ruled. The book just on the other side of this book, Ruth, uh, and very 
quickly, what we have here is a, a snapshot of one family who lived during the, during the days of the judges. During the days of the judges, Jez showed us all last week, it was a mess. The country of Israel, last chapter of Judges, verse 25, in those days Israel had no king, everyone did as they saw fit. It was the Wild West. Might was right. Everyone pursued their own agendas and outcomes. Which means it was a dangerous time especially for women. There was no ruler, no ruler to fix it and keep safety and peace. It was dangerous. In the days of judges, these events happen. That's the context. And then the next four verses, down to verse 5, focus in on this one family in the days of the judges. There was a famine in the land. So a man from Bethlehem, in Judah, took his wife and his two sons and went to live for a while in the country of Moab. He takes his wife, Naomi, his two boys, and they set off. While in the country of Moab, they lived there, verse 2, and the boys, the two sons, married. Verse 4, they married Moabite women uh, and they lived there about 10 years. But then the father dies and the two sons die. So that verse 5, Naomi was left without her two sons and her husband. She is now alone. And it's in the days of the judges. This is dangerous for a woman, a widow, with foreign daughters-in-law, alone. Now that whole patch for the first five verses takes about ten years. And let me just uh, step back a touch from this. I said we'd do this on the way through. Let me just step back with this for a moment. And notice how this whole thing's put together. This writer is very clever. And it's something to notice as we go through the whole book. The first five verses go, take about 10 years, engage with 10 years of history. And, and the writer reports for us those historical events, this kind of uh, staccato, it's got a bang, bang, this happens, this happens, this happens. But then at verse 6... The whole account slows down and from verse 8 on to the end of the chapter, the writer focuses on a series of conversations between Naomi, the mother, and the daughters-in-law and then between Naomi and the people in Bethlehem. There's a series of conversations that are reported and they take a considerable amount of time. So what you've got here is the first five verses covers 10 years. The next 20 or so verses cover about 10 minutes. And what that tells you is that the writer wants you to focus on the second half from verse 6 on. The first five verses really are just context, really just setting the scene, really just putting you in the position to see that Naomi, the mum, is on her own. Now having said that, we do need to pay a bit more attention to those first five verses because we're 21st century Australians, we don't know about the culture back then and we won't pick up things that the first readers would have picked up. Let me just give you two quick background pieces here. The first one is the famine. There was a famine in the land. Now literally it says there was no bread in the land. So a man from Bethlehem, and the word Bethlehem means house of bread. And what's being said here is there was no bread in the land, not even in the house of bread, Bethlehem. Things are bad in the time of judges. Israel was a mess under God's judgment. Second thing, Moab. You can see they leave, the father, Elimelech, takes his family, his wife and his children, to Moab. Now a bit of background here, because it plays into the whole book. Moab. Moab had a history with Israel. And it wasn't a good history. And it wasn't Israel's fault. Moab was against Israel and her God and had been forever. Moab had actively worked to seduce the Israelites away from serving their God. Moab refused Israel a pathway through their country when they were just trying to get to their land and it wouldn't let it through. 
Moab then uh, called curses down upon Israel uh, to try and destroy them. Moab's the enemy. Moab's actively against Israel and her God. And Israel actually is told in the book of uh, Deuteronomy not to go to Moab and not to marry a Moabitess. Um, all of this matters to know because Ruth is from Moab. And that will become hugely important as we go through the book. But the other reason it's important to know is the dad. He took his family to Moab. Now just a couple of quick comments to fathers. This is not the main point here, but it's hard not to notice this and pay attention to it. You know, there's lots of things different from that culture to our culture. You need to notice this, of course, that um, uh, the father takes his family into Moab um, and that in itself, oh, you know, is, was it sinful? Well, David takes his parents into Moab as well in 1 Samuel 22. Uh, it, it was faithless though. It was a bad choice. It wasn't a great move. Now, lots of things are different. Um, uh, us moving to another place, to another country, another city, another state, that's not bad. We, we don't have the same promised land in one region that if you move out of the promised land, you move away from the people of God and that's what he was doing, moving into Moab where there was no faith community of Israel, there was no supports for his life of serving God. Uh, he was moving into another country without any of that. The enemies actively... It's hard to find that parallel today. You can move, people can move. But lots of things are the same. Fathers, your decisions will impact your kids, for better or for worse. Now, Limelech took his family away from the community of faith, the people of God. Verse 2, just for a little while, just to get some food, to come back. But they ended up staying and putting down roots, as happens. And his kids married outside the faith, married Moabite women. There's a sense in which the father had a half-baked faith. He didn't trust the Lord and seek to hold firm to the life of the Lord's people. And that played out in his family's life, in his kids' life. Because in this context, more's, more's caught than taught. Men, what you do, why you do it, matters to your family spiritually one thing it matters men and women but the power of a father in this is huge it matters fathers that you prioritize getting your family to be with the people of God to not make decisions that move them away from an opportunity to be with the people of God more is caught than taught they will see, your kids will see your priorities. During this time of lockdown, um, it really is fundamentally important that you take a lead in getting your family around the stream, to, to having devotions, Bible reading around the dinner table. It matters that you take a lead in these things. You make a massive difference. So do you, Mum. But men and women pay attention to this. Now come back to their world. Naomi. The mum, verse 5, she's alone. She's lost a, a husband, she's lost the two sons. In the time of the judges, dog eat dog. There's no job seeker. She's alone and vulnerable. She's in trouble. Now the story slows down. Verse 6 when Naomi heard in Moab that the Lord had come to the aid of his people as he was going to, by providing food, she and her daughters-in-law prepared to return home from there. Naomi heads back. And notice the language there of the word return in verse 6. It's used all the way through this chapter. And the word return in the original language in, the, in Hebrew actually has the same idea as repent. You can use it interchangeably. And what you have here is a picture of Naomi repenting heading back and then verse 8 we get the first spoken words the first speech where it really slows down and we pay attention to the guts of the story verse 8 she tells her daughters-in-law to go back to Moab to leave her 
and go back to their families where they might have a chance to marry and find a husband and so on. Get protection and provision back there. Now verse 11, Naomi goes hard at this. And let me summarise what she says. I've got nothing. You come with me, you'll have nothing. One of the daughters, verse 14, is convinced. At this they wept aloud and Orpah kissed her mother-in-law goodbye, but Ruth clung to her. Now Orpah's leaving and going back to Moab. It's not criticised, there's no criticism in it. It's the most reasonable thing to do. Naomi's pushed hard, had to push twice for this woman to go back and she reluctantly finally goes back. Only Ruth is left. And in this, just another piece of background too, because it'll be helpful for us to see this for the rest of the story. Did you notice the odd thing there in verse 12, as Emma read it for us? Did you notice the bit about Naomi talking about her own marriage? She says there in verse, return home, my daughters, I'm too old to have another husband. And even if I thought there was still hope for me, even if I had a husband tonight, then gave birth to sons, would you wait until they grew up? Would you remain unmarried for them? Now, (laughs) which... Which woman amongst us would think that little option needs to be ruled out by the mother-in-law to make sure they don't come back with her? I mean, how many of you are waiting around hoping that she remarries and has a son and eventually he grows up? Things are very different today. But that mattered then. It mattered then. Because as a way of protecting the family name... And as a way of keeping the woman's property, the man, the dead husband's property, in the family, she needed to remarry and have a child so that when she dies, she can pass the property on to her family. These things mattered back in ancient Israel. And you need to know this, actually, because of future weeks. It'll become a very important piece as we go through. In Israel, this thing mattered. But the point, Naomi's saying, I've got nothing. And I've got no way to provide for you and protect you in the days of the judges. I want nothing. And notice in all of this the emotion. Did you see it? That the writer, again what I want to keep trying to show you is how clever. This this is someone who knows how to tell a story. I mean it's it's, it's it's a a piece of fact that this storyteller is reporting. But he, he, she has put the material together very cleverly. And did you see, when you get to this piece, verse 9, we're told all about their feelings. Verse 9, she kissed them goodbye, they wept aloud, they said to her, you've got kissing and weeping. You get the same thing in verse 14, they wept aloud again, then Orpah kissed her mother-in-law goodbye, but Ruth clung to her. It's full of emotion. It's, very, it's deep and profound and you're meant to pay attention. Did you notice in the first five verses, we hear, we hear the most tragic experiences. Uh, <clears throat> Naomi lost her, her husband, then lost her two sons in the space of those few years. But we're not given any mention of emotion or feeling until now. Why? I want to suggest it's to set the scene for Ruth. Naomi's in a terrible place and the daughters-in-law know it. They love her. There's something deep in the relationship with them. They weep with her. They cling to her. Uh, The the daughter-in-law that leaves and goes back does it reluctantly. But to go with Naomi back to the land of Israel, to keep with her, will be costly. She's got nothing. She's empty. And verse 12, did you see the language there, the the idea of the word hope? Uh, Even if I thought there was still hope for me, Naomi is hopeless. She is completely bereft of hope. She's got nothing. There's no future. Which raises for us massive questions. What is her future? Is there anything in the future? Where is God in all of this? Is there any hope? which all sets the scene for Ruth. And the book is named after this woman, Ruth. You see, one daughter-in-law leaves, and there's no criticism. It was the most sane thing to do. But what does Ruth do? Well, Ruth speaks. And in verse 16, 
she speaks words that are some of the most beautiful words ever spoken in the whole Bible. In fact, some of you may find yourself, when you hear these words, uh, I've, I've heard those words before. You might have just found yourself hearing them around in our culture. They've been so famous and so profound. So listen to them, verse 16, with all of this emotion and high energy and Naomi in the pits and she's got no hope, there's no future, she's got nothing to provide, Ruth says this, don't urge me to leave you or turn back from you, where you go I will go and where you stay I will stay, your people will be my people. And your God, my God. When you die, I will die, and there I'll be buried. May the Lord deal with me, be it ever so severely, even if death separates you and me. Wow. Ruth pledges herself to Naomi to be for her and with her at cost to herself for Naomi's good, she binds herself, she commits till death do us part. Even though it will cost her everything, even though there's another path that she could go where she might find a marriage partner, where she might find a future back with, she commits to Naomi and her God. It's a beautiful thing, it's an act of love. It's a deep expression of Ruth's love. Imagine having someone love you like that. Now here we're meant to slow down and pay attention. We're meant to notice Ruth and how impressive she is. And notice actually too that I think at this point she's converted. She uses there, the, um, in verse 17, the personal name of God, the capital L-O-R-D, Yahweh. She talks about her God now as Yahweh, that she's got an intimate relationship with her. But we're meant to particularly notice what she's done here, that she's acted with such astonishing love. You know, this, this act of Ruth is mentioned a number of times in the book, which, which alerts you that the writer's warning us to notice this. It's mentioned in 2.11 and 3.11, that everyone's talking about what you did for your mother-in-law, that you're a woman of noble character, and all the town knows that Ruth is an exemplary person. See, she isn't just one more person in the story. This is why the book's named after her. She's the model person. There'll be a man who emerges next chapter. One of the reasons the book is written, I take it, is to show us Ruth, that we might learn what love is by seeing Ruth in action. So this is big. Now, it's not the big thing. We'll come to the big thing in a moment, but... But this is big. This is much of what runs through the whole book of Ruth. Um, <clears throat> and it's big for us. It's big for us today in our culture to hear this, actually. Uh, has there ever been a time in history when we are more confused about love than our day? Let me ask you a question. And I don't know if you want to pause. You don't need to, I think, on this one. But what is love? How would a person answer that question today? I think we know exactly how they'd answer today. If I gave you the sentence, love is dot, 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 how would you fill in the dots? What's the first thing that comes into your mind when I say love is? Love is? Love. Isn't that, isn't that our big slogan today? Now, what is that? Love is love. I'm tempted to say it is the dumbest thing I've ever heard, but it's not actually dumb. It's very clever. It's saying something deep and profound, deep and profoundly wrong or confused, but deep. What it's saying is, what it means, I dare say, is that love is love means you can't define love. No one can say what love is, absolutely. It's whatever you want it to be. Whatever you say love is, well, that's love. Love is love. Whatever you feel in love, whatever that is, that's love for you. Don't let anyone say otherwise. Don't tell anyone tell you that it's not. Love is love. You know, I think our world has lost it. What is love? 
It's at one level one of the very reasons the Bible is written, to show us what love is. And it uses all kinds of different ways. Here it uses Ruth, her speech, her character. What's love? It's the tender commitment to another person for their sake. For what they gain not you. That's love. And the heart of love is faithful, tender commitment. Commitment. Faithfulness. From a heart of tenderness for the sake of the other. So much attention in this section is paid to the costliness of Ruth staying with her mother-in-law. Ruth doesn't just stay with her, she binds herself to her mother-in-law. For better, for worse. For richer, for poorer. In sickness. What is love? Faithfulness. Sacrificial commitment. Tenderly. For the sake of the other. Now this book uses a special word for love. It uses it at least three times. It uses the word hesed. There's a little Hebrew word for you, hesed. Very important word. Remember it, it'll come up for us again and again. Hesed. You'll see it translated here in verse 8. It's translated as, the, may the Lord show you kindness, hesed. Loving kindness. The book is written to help us appreciate what hesed is. Hesed is the love that binds itself to another, that commits to the other, that um, um, is faithful to the other, whatever the other brings, for better, for worse. And Ruth is a wonderful picture of it. Let me give you a modern picture. Robinson McQuilkin was a president of a Bible college in the United States, a very significant Bible college, a growing Bible college, a, a theological college that was training up young men and women to go off into missionary work and off into pastoring in churches and so on. It was a critical role. <clears throat> His wife of 40 years got Alzheimer's. Friends said to put her in an institution where she can be looked after. He chose to resign his position and he took up as her full-time carer and embraced the pain of daily losing her. The good days when she remembered, the bad days when she couldn't remember, when he was a nobody and he went through years of caring for his ailing wife and he said this, when the time came the decision was firm, it took no great calculation. It was a matter of integrity. Had I not promised 42 years before, in sickness and in health, till death do us part. This was no grim duty to which I stoically resigned myself, however. It was only fair. She had, after all, cared for me for almost four decades with marvellous devotion. Now it was my turn. And such a partner she was. If I took care of her for 40 years, I would never be out of her debt. Hesed. Loving kindness. Your people will be my people. Where you go, I will go. Where you stay, I'll stay. May the Lord deal with me ever so severely, even if death separates you and me, for better, for worse. Hesed. Who is not moved by that? Now, why? Why do we hear that and find it inspiring? Despite the foolishness of the world that we live in, that calls whatever you want to call love, love is love, whatever love is for you, it's love for you. But we're still moved by when, when we see true love. Because we know it when we see it. We, we know that there's nobility in true love. There's grandeur and greatness and glory. It's inspiring, true love. Tender, sacrificial faithfulness. One person to another. Why does it move us so? I'll tell you why. Because we are made in the image of God, who is in his very being, Hesed. 
loving kindness. And he made us after himself in his image so that, so that we know it when we see it. The Bible gives these pictures, Ruth, and we'll see a male picture later as we go along, but the Bible gives these pictures and then blows them out of the water. With the greatest act of love the universe has ever seen. When the child born to this woman, Ruth, has a child, has a child, has a child, all the way down through history, until finally the child, God's own son, the Lord Jesus Christ, is born into our world, given to us by a God of love, to die for us on a cross as a sacrifice, to pay our debt that we might be forgiven and won back to himself. It wasn't an act of God loving the deserving. What made it so extraordinary was that it was a costly love of faithful devotion to a people who'd been rebellious. He said, 1 John, this is love. Not that we loved God, but that he loved us and gave his son as an atoning sacrifice for our sins. This is what love is. Friends, learn, learn, learn love. Be in awe of the God of love. Never tire of hearing about the love of God. And thank Him and rejoice and be like Him. Be like Ruth. Ruth is a picture of true womanhood. The greatness of womanhood. There's a sense in which she's very weak, she's hugely vulnerable, but she's hugely strong. Not invincible, but she's strong where it matters. And she embodies the proverb, actually, that charm is deceptive, beauty is fleeting. But a woman of noble character, there's greatness. Be like Ruth. Fight the temptation that is around you to think that being a woman is this or being a woman is... Th Fight all of that temptation and see what the Bible calls you to, calls men to. A thing of great depth and character, nobility, love, hesed, like him. You see, this is a big piece through the book of Ruth. It'll keep coming up again and again. It's not the biggest thing, we'll get there just in a second. But it's huge to keep being alert to it. Hesed, loving kindness. But let's now get to the big thing and finish. The big thing emerges in Ruth, in Naomi's last speech. It's there in verse 20. Naomi comes back to Bethlehem. They've arrived there. Ruth is by her side. And verse 20, she speaks to the gathered group who have welcomed her back. Don't call me Naomi, she told them. Call me Mara. Naomi means sweet, Mara means bitter, because the Almighty has made my life very bitter. I went away full, but the Lord has brought me back empty. Underline that, because that's the theme that runs through the book. I went away full, but the Lord has brought me back empty. Why call me Naomi? The Lord has afflicted me. The Almighty has brought misfortune upon me. At this point, she's at rock bottom. And here's the big thing. It's in her speech. She has it right and she has it wrong. She has it right. She rightly sees God's hand at work in her life. The Almighty has made my life. The Lord has brought me back empty. The Almighty has... She is right to see that everything that's happened to her has been under the sovereign hand of God. Hugely important to see. And notice this, as you go through those couple of verses, you'll see she uses God's, she talks about God in two different ways. She uses two different words for God. She uses the word almighty and she uses the word Lord, two times each. And, and, and the little speech is bracketed by the Almighty and the Almighty, beginning and end, and the Lord sits in the middle. Now, you need to know about these two words. The Almighty translates the Hebrew word Shaddai. It, it, it's an expression of God as in His greatness and His power and His might. 
the word Lord is God's personal name. It's his goodness and his intimacy and his covenant relationship. She uses these two words, words that draw attention to the fact that God is powerful. He is the Almighty. He is the God of armies. And the Almighty has done this. She's right. God is sovereign. It's the testimony of the whole Bible that everything happens according to the purpose of his will. There's nothing outside of his sovereign control. If you've gone through terrible times, the Lord is sovereign over it. She's right. But she's wrong. She says, I've come back empty. Really? Look who's standing next to you. Here is a woman who has given her love to you like no one else. No one in that town has got someone like Ruth. You're not empty. You know, here's the thing. You can go so low in life that you don't even see what's there to be seen. When great grief comes upon you, when great tragedy strikes... One of the things that happens for us is that our horizons shrink and the world gets smaller and I can't see beyond my grief and my pain. It happens so often, it's so powerful. I've come back empty, she says, and she she has lost so much, a husband, two sons, absolutely, but she's not got nothing. But she just can't see it. And look at how beautifully the writer puts it. I love this. Look at verse 22. Naomi returned from Moab, accompanied by Ruth, the Moabite, her daughter-in-law, arriving in Bethlehem as the barley harvest was beginning. She comes back thinking she's got nothing at the very time when empty baskets are being filled up. And the writer says to us, she's on the verge of something. If only she could see it. Do you know, this is the message of the book. This is the great message of the book. Right at the time when you're at your lowest, God is right there, plotting your future for your good to fill you up again. And that is a powerful truth because God is the Almighty, you see. He is Shaddai. Nothing happens apart from His will. You know, here's why the Bible pays a great deal of attention to the sovereignty of God. And and here's why we bang on about it in our church here, because the Bible does, but because it's important for our life. You know, we only have hope in the midst of tragedy when you know that God is even in control of that tragedy. Because if God is not in control of tragedy, then you can't have any confidence that he'll turn things around. If God is sovereign, though, he is in control of all things. If he's not sovereign, he's in control of nothing. And we have no hope that there's one who can bring good from bad. We also bang on about humility and the need for repentance and faith. In God because the ones God promises to bring good to are the humble the ones who have bent their knee back under his lordship the ones who have put their trust in the love the Hesed love of God who sent his son to die for us who have put their faith in him and come back into relationship with God as their Lord the humble and that's Naomi she's come back She didn't have a great beginning, but she's returned. And here she is, humbled, empty, with nothing, at her lowest. And right at that moment, in her deepest sorrow, God was plotting her greatest satisfaction. She came back at the time when the barley harvest was beginning. It was the time God was about to fill her. Do you believe this? 
The Bible insists it's true. For those that have humbled themselves before him, he is forever with you. In the valley, even in the valley of the shadow of death, he is there with you. He's your shepherd. He is working all things together for your good. The sovereign almighty Yahweh. Blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted because of the sovereign power of God who is the Hesed God. God the Almighty is on his throne and he promises to bring you good to the humbled. And he's doing it in the unspectacular. You know, there's no miracle in this book. There's no vision. There's no prophetic words. There's no signs and wonders. There's no writing on the wall. There's nothing spectacular. God's hidden. It's very ordinary. Naomi and Ruth, I mean, they're not unaware that God is there, but they can't see him at all in their circumstances. But what Naomi hasn't reckoned on is the hesed of God. The faithful, loving, tender kindness of the almighty God for the humbled. Because standing next to her, at the point where she thinks she's got nothing, as the barley harvest is about to commence, is Ruth. The source under God of her filling. God is unseen in the circumstances of her life, but he's there with a plan to fill her up. And brothers and sisters, he's with you. I know so many of you have gone through terrible things recently. But in whatever you're going through, in your sorrow, in your tragedy, in the lockdown, he's there with you, plotting your satisfaction. Trust him. He will lift you up. There's always hope you see this book there's always hope if you know this God if you're humble before this God if you're with this God in relationship through Jesus there's always hope why because God is the God of Hesed love whatever you're in he'll lift you up not always straight away but he will in due course Trust him. Let's pray. Oh, Heavenly Father, we thank you for the revelation of the truth of who you are. We thank you for the revelation of those great twin truths of your great almighty power and your Hesed love. Your determination to be faithful and committed to us to all those who humble themselves before you and bow the knee to you as God. We thank you that you are working all things together for good. Please help us reflect on these things, believe these things, trust these things and therefore always find hope in the midst of whatever circumstances we're in. That you, the God of Hesed love, is plotting our good. Thank you for this revelation, this truth, in Jesus' name. Amen.